Hello, how you doing? How you doing? It's good. It's great whenever it's a non-artist interview because then I get to bring back the drums. What's up? And the audience, what's up? How you guys? I hope you've been well. What's new? What's new? Welcome back to another music interview. I'm Justin the Floor God. This is the So Who's Up Next podcast, the show of curious conversations, speaking with artists and people in the music space about ideas that inspire. The Little Known Tracks podcast is up next. Hosting a music interview podcast isn't anything new, I would know, but co-hosts Alex and Sydney do a fantastic job of creating an environment where artists can speak about their craft alongside the rest of their lives rather than being separate from it. You'll know more about what this means by the end of the episode, but our conversation begins with caterpillars and ends with butterflies. At some point, I brought up one of my biggest creative fears, whether or not what I'm making is worth doing, and I asked them how they create value in their work. Their answers reminded me of a scene in the movie Dead Poets Society where Robin Williams' character tells his students something along the lines of this. I'm about to quote it, but like paraphrased. We do our work because we're members of the human race, and the human race is filled with passion. You're here. Life exists. And the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. So, what will your verse be? Something to that extent, right? I obviously added some words in there. Big ideas ahead. Let's get into it. Little known tracks. Nice to have you guys on the show. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Two hosts. That's a completely different dynamic than what I'm used to, for sure. How'd you guys get started in the podcast space? What was that like for you? So I'm going to say I probably started a little bit earlier than Sydney. When I like started like quote unquote podcasting, it was for a class and it was like little man on the street things where I just went up to people, asked stupid questions. Like nice. I think one of the first ones I did, I went up and asked a bunch of people how many caterpillars they could eat in a minute. Oh, yikes. And that was <laughs> that was not the assignment. That was just I did stupid things. I I really enjoyed audio stuff in general. Mm. At first, I also did enjoy like the editing and stuff. I think that was probably because it wasn't as long as I am familiar with now. Mm. That was more or less how I got into it. I ran another podcast for a little while with my brothers. And then, of course, with Sydney, we were in school and we did radio together for our last year in school. So I think that was a big thing that kind of got us together doing audio stuff yeah. so we knew we were able to talk to each other like over mic alex was telling me about an idea he had for a podcast that was i think more like news based it was like a current event kind of thing and he was like i think i want to do this and i was like dude go for it you have all the equipment like it's, you have the idea hmm. and then i got a text one day and was like do you want to start a podcast yeah. <laughs> so i was like sure why not like Sounds like fun. And obviously that idea translated into something very different that we're like doing right now because it started with that like current event kind of just like learning new things mm -hmm. podcast. But now we do a music podcast. So it was like a big developmental switch, but I'm really glad of where we landed because I really like what we're doing now. Yeah, no. And I think that makes for a perfect segue. But before we get into that, I have to ask Alex, were you supplying the caterpillars? Because I can only imagine you like walking up to people asking, hey, how many caterpillars can you fit in your mouth? And then pulling from behind your back, like this cup full of caterpillars, like here, these ones are <laughs> spiky. Try to get these in your mouth. Or were you just you didn't you didn't have any you weren't abusing animals, were you? <laughs> Okay, so I had a response, and then you said abusing animals, so it makes my response sound a little bit, like, uh -oh, meaner. Uh -oh. <laughs> but unfortunately, I did not have caterpillars. All right. They were just, just hypothetical questions. Um, if I could, could have gotten caterpillars, I may have offered some people caterpillars. One of the people that I talked to had actively eaten caterpillars and talked about, like, frying them and Ooh. whatnot. Yikes. So I've heard of eating mealworms as a thing. And I was curious about that. I was like, uh, should I try this? And the answer is maybe in the future, if I have access to some premium mealworms. But if some yeah. dude on the street, believe me, I'm not taking bugs as food from a guy who's offering, I mean, probably like shoving a microphone in my face too. Like that's a big yikes. But um, back to the stuff though. So Sydney, with your response, it's a bit more on track. You mentioned a shift between the kind of stuff you were doing in the beginning and then you guys 
now have a music podcast. So what drove you to get started in the music space? Like, what was that like? And why did you go so far in with like a music interview show? Go yeah, go, go ahead, Sid. You, <laughs> you, oh, no. you go ahead. I'm scared. <laughs> you got this one. <laughs> so the way we ended up doing a, a music podcast, I don't want to say it was by mistake, but it was kind of by sheer just pushing through doing this one. Okay. So <laughs> we had the one idea completely separate and I found something and it was like a podcast competition and it was like, OK, make a podcast. And you could win gear and then we'll support you while doing it and this and that. And so we were sitting in the car trying to come up with an idea. And I think we were like our friend, um, Zach, who we talked to, Young Blasian. We were like, he's a musician and he's such an interesting character. Hmm. What if we just like talk to like underground musicians? Yeah. And we're like, going from like, what do we have in common, like have in common that we could have a yeah. conversation about? And we're mm. both super into music, relatively similar, like taste in music. So we were sitting in the car. Alex goes, we could call it like little known tracks. And it was just like this, like word vomit that like mm. turned into the, what I think is like, the greatest catchiest yeah. name and i was like okay well now we have to do it because uh -huh. that's a great name and we can't not use it that was where that idea came from and as we were pursuing it we were like this could really be like something that we really enjoy doing so we scrapped the other idea and did, like turned to this one full time yeah no that i mean that seems like a logical progression just who do we know and have access to that can kick it with us for a while on the show that we don't even know how, that we're doing yet kind of thing and then you made it and then now you're here i think that's really great um, and if you have you know at least somewhat of a passion for it why not dive all the way in why not explore that curiosity for a minute i just listen to music and i kind of <laughs> analyze it from like that production standpoint like oh I bet I can make this kick or whatever, you know, but for you guys, what's that process like? Like, how do you dissect these artists before you talk to them? So it's a lot of listening to their music, but also just researching and talking to them kind of beforehand in a sense of like, what do they do outside of music too? So our like big thing is learning about the person behind the music, mm -hmm. kind of seeing what they have, like what their hobbies are and then really diving into their music. So whether that be, their new releases or checking out their website, their social medias, like see all the stuff that they have going on to get that both aspects. Yeah. So it's sort of like a research into the person and the person's past and music and stuff, and then trying to see how that connects to like some of the answers that they had given us mm. as responses and stuff. And then just kind of how to connect those things a little bit more to try and elevate the artist as a person as well. So it's not just like, this is music. It's mm. this is a person yeah. who has a passion for stuff and is pursuing that. Yeah, no, that's super cool. As far as the research goes, do you guys ever feel like you're like stock, like borderline stalking these people? Because I know, at least for me, like there's always that creepy factor where I'm like, oh, yikes, like this is like objectively kind of weird. I'm really looking into this person's life for a minute and trying to be like, how can I get them to say something they might not really want to say, but have been thinking for a while? Like, that's just like a creepy thought. But do you guys feel the same way or are you comfortable just like, yeah, it's research, whatever, whatever? I mean, I've never thought about it that way. But now <laughs> the next time we're looking into an artist, I'm probably going to be like, man, I'm super far in their Instagram feed. So <laughs> <laughs> objectively might be a little weird, but I've always like chalked it up to just knowing as much as I can mm. to, yeah. you know, do it for the sport. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Listen, oh, no. we both went to school for communications mm -hmm. and a big part of that was journalism. Yeah. 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 Journalism. So, research, so digging into people and research and stuff is something that mm -hmm. is just, if you're going to interview someone, you need to know everything about them. Mm -hmm. It's just journalism. It's yeah. just part of the job. For sure. It's not weird. When you go to interview someone, what's the one or two things you're really, really hoping for out of them to get like a good, I guess, quote unquote, performance from their interview? One of my favorite things to talk about or bring up in an interview is talking to people about the first song they ever wrote. We've done it in a, a couple talking to different people because usually they're like, oh, I was like, you know, 11 or 12 when I wrote my first song. And they'll be like, 
it was horrible but I'm like but was it if that was like your jumping off point for like when you really started writing music so that's something that I always like look forward and try to bring into interviews because everyone's always like uh it's so different from what I do now Mm -hmm. but I always think that's a super interesting way to talk to artists about their evolution through music yeah I really thought okay because you said something I like to talk about Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say the Jonas Brothers. What? Now, here's the thing. I Okay, I love the Jonas Brothers, and I will talk about them whenever somebody brings them up. <laughs> but they always happen to come up when we talk to Constantly. people, but I never bring them up. It's whoever we're That's in a so room good. brings them up, <laughs> and Alex always is like, are you kidding me? Like, to me. <laughs> That's so good. Because he's like, how does that always happen? But I, I don't know. I appreciate it, because then I just get to talk about them a little bit more yeah (laughs) give me a give me a tier list real quick like who's the best jonas brother and why okay so yeah we're getting into this alex we're talking about this this is new to me i'm gonna (laughs) make a mistake you did you did this is a a happy (laughs) accident right here we're bob ross in it right now all right Sydney, (laughs) sydney take it away it's all yours so the jonas brothers i've been listening to them since i was nine and i'm 23 now so that's been a long time joe jonas has always been my favorite couldn't tell you why i just think he's super cool and i love the sound of his voice kevin and nick are also very cool and i enjoy everything that they do in the band i've just been listening to them so long that it's like turned into a personality trait so like like it's gotten to the point where people like hear the word jonas brothers Mm. and they think of me or they're like oh that's so good it really makes me laugh because it's a weird thing but i don't like brothers right. are synonymous with sydney now is just <laughs> just how it like, goes they like announced all their comeback stuff i was in school crying looking at my phone everyone's like are you okay and i was like this is the best day of my whole life <laughs> oh my <laughs> the Jonas brothers are back that's so good <laughs> alex i can see on your face you're not enjoying this part of the talk but it, like, is it the same reaction? Is it this visceral whenever you're recording your own episodes and the Jonas Brothers come up? Do you just like this big eye roll or like, how do you contain yourself? Um, There's no containment. It's a big there eye isn't. Roll. I'll normally like mention it and say something to both Sid and whoever we're talking nice. to about the fact that wow. this continues to happen. Oh my God. I mean, I don't contain <laughs> That's, and I don't even bring it up. That's the that's the point. He never brings yeah. it up. That's really Free weird. Cross. Something I had on my show for a while was people kept talking about onesies and like being in a onesie, and I was like, "That's, that's such, fun." Such, it sounds fun, but it's like a weird like. Why do people the have niche. this connection? Yeah, yeah. Normal dudes, you know, hanging out in a onesie or whatnot, <laughs> or not dudes, but just like one one dude. You know, it isn't like a group activity. Yeah. How do you prevent having the same conversation? Because that's something I ask myself. I'm constantly trying to innovate. I mean, with everyone new has a new perspective to some degree. But how do you guarantee new content every time? You can't really guarantee that. But you could always get like something different. I think, again, one of the things that we try to do is like things outside of music because everyone's going to have something a little different, at least to some extent. I think we try to pull stories out of people in some capacity in, in like that area. Once we get into music, it's a lot more like listening and trying to like concoct new questions as they're talking and just trying to work with them to make it interesting. It doesn't necessarily have to be like extremely different and like crazy. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of getting them to talk because at a certain point, if you get someone to kind of open up a little bit, it's easier to keep like picking away and they'll just keep saying more stuff if that makes sense what you went to school in communications you guys came up on journalism definitely i think giving you an edge to just jump in and do something like this or not jump in alex you mentioned that you spent a few months sitting on the idea before you actually took action but like any good idea it needs to be worked out as best it can but where do you want to take this? Like, what, what's your what's your vision for the show? I know for me, like, at least the next year, I just kind of want to be doing the same stuff to greater and greater heights, whatever that means, you know, talking to bigger artists or more artists, you know, content's always great too. But for you guys, what's that looking like? What's the goal with Little Known Tracks? Love to be doing this full time. We talk about that, like, <laughs> right now, 
like in the future, that would definitely be the goal to be able to do this on a bigger scale full time. Mm -hmm. Right now, though, I don't want to say, oh, that's like wishful thinking, because I know both of us have a lot of skill doing this. Like, I think we have like a lot of know how and stuff like that. But for right now, I think it's something that we enjoy doing. Talking to artists, trying to just like spread that. We listen to everyone that we interview. Mm -hmm. And I think it's safe to say that we have enjoyed like all of their music, at least to some extent. And just kind of getting those people who aren't like superstars, having other people experience what we are in terms of like music and stuff, I think is something that I enjoy as part of this project. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely cool to be able to connect with people from literally all over the world mm -hmm. on common platform of music and music creation and like we're not musicians ourselves well alex kind of is i don't play any instruments but i think it's so interesting to hear about the process behind mm -hmm. all the music just being able to have that platform has been really cool yeah for sure i mean i can definitely relate i agree that like you don't well i mean you didn't say this but i think that you don't need to play instruments to you know host a podcast obviously about music you can just like music but something even further than that alex you mentioned that you know you at least a little bit like everyone's music who's been on your podcast and you know we could chalk that up to spending so, so much time with them being in their world being biased whatnot but and or just genuinely liking their music but would you ever have anyone on your show that like whose music you don't like but you can like really fuck with as a person because i know at least for me like I'm definitely down to talk with anyone if we're going to have a good conversation. Like the music doesn't always have to come first. So what's that mindset for you guys? Did you have to like their stuff or is there room for some, you know, let's just have a good talk kind of thing? I mean, I think there's always room for some like, let's just kind of have a talk stuff. I don't necessarily have to like love the music and, and like the music. I think one of the things is we listen to a lot of music. So even if I don't like it, I think I can be like familiar with some of it and go, OK, well, that's not my cup of tea. There's effort put into this. Someone is passionate about doing this. So I think they're worth taking the time to talk to. You know what I mean? Even if it's not like my preference of genre of whatever you want to call it, it's somebody's like mm. that is definitely somebody's favorite music. So being able to you know, still have that platform and have the artists talk about their process and everything that goes behind it, I think, is very much the point, like standing point behind the podcast and just being able to use that platform to get their word out about their music. Any amount of passion you can engage with is always a fun time, music or otherwise. Sydney, you were mentioning earlier, like learning about people's processes is super cool. I agree. And it doesn't have to be music. The show could be about books or writing, you know, and it would be the same show. Um, and I would still get, I mean, obviously probably not as much satisfaction out of it, but I would still be like really, really happy with it because of the same thing. Like just learning about stories and processes is so, so valuable, especially as like people, you know what I mean? And given this past year, we haven't really been too close. Having my show has definitely helped me supplement some social behaviors. You know what I mean? I mean, it's really distance and we're not in the same room but we're having a talk, you know, like I'm in your ears, you're in, you're in mine. And we're, we're like, we're hanging out kind of. So is that kind of what it's like for you guys I, or no? Yeah. I think, I think not even just that, that like I get to talk to you and we have this connection, but I think one of the things is that at least I hope, and I think people are able to form some connection to either us or the artists and stuff and still kind of get something out of it, mm -hmm. despite not actively being part of the conversation, if that makes sense. Like, I enjoy talking to you, but I've also listened to you speak with other people, and it still helps me to understand you as a person and right. connect with you on that level still. Since this has started, like, well, not post-quarantine, but like in the middle when everybody was still social distanced and everything, a lot of the people we talked to were writing music throughout it and like that was a lot of our like early conversations for those episodes are really like oh i wrote this in quarantine this is like a you know quote unquote quarantine album and stuff like that so being able to still be connected while apart is i think an interesting feat just because it's become so common within the past year everything's been having to be done over zoom over the internet so like it's just been 
in a way normalized mm -hmm. the the way we've been doing it, but like still being able to be connected. Just translating that concept to like movies, like Black Widow just dropped at the time of we're recording this, and that was in theaters and on streaming platforms, or maybe one. I don't know which one, but it's out in both places because people are still distanced and that's become normalized. Granted, podcasts have existed in this format you know, long before us, and they will probably after as well. But just to have this moment and to come up kind of in the same space where it's like, there was so much attention to this kind of content, because that's all we had, for the most part, it is a super cool concept. As far as keeping up with the rat race, that is content creation, and then also trying to stand out. How do you guys think one should act to stand out or make something that's reasonably meaningful? I think it's a really hard thing to do because while it's not like as oversaturated as a lot of other things like news and politics and things of that nature, there is a lot here and there's a lot to, I don't want to say compete with because I don't think it should be like a competition. Mm -hmm. We're all creators. We're all passionate about this. And it's something that we can all work together to try and make better. But it, like you said, it's hard to stand out. Because as much as it isn't like a competition, it sort of is. Yeah. It's just very hard because there's so much that goes into just content and art in general that no matter what you do, you're not going to stand out like in any particular in, in some particular space. So I think it's about finding where everyone else's niches are already and trying to find a space that is unoccupied in that hole yeah i think if that kind of tracks mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense like i can just think of it real easy as like a puzzle right you're just i mean there are gaps yeah. maybe in the whole picture but the whole picture exists so why not try to be that one piece i, I definitely can relate but sydney exactly. what, what do you think like how, how do you make something that's meaningful and standoutable you know if, if you can to Alex's point, like it's not a competition because we're all passionate about it, but then numbers get involved and then it looks like it is one. And yeah. I think that's where things can get, I don't know if it's like skewed, but then that's when you start comparing like engagement didn't go as well as this previous post or something like that. I think when that gets involved, not that you can't take it too seriously, but as long as you're producing content, people will see it. You can't get discouraged if something doesn't do as well as you hope it would, because then it's on to the next and maybe that one will be better. So I think it's just a consistency kind of deal. As long as content is coming out and it's stuff that you're proud of, too. I know that gets hard, like a quality over quantity kind of thing when yeah. you're just pushing out content. But, you know, as long as you enjoy what you're putting out, like, I think that should be first and foremost over what the response is to it. I think that's a, a concept that, you know, everyone, not just content creators need to really take to heart because, you know, we exist in the digital age where whether we like it or not, we're going to be in competition, even if our end goal is the same and we're moving in the same direction. It's a matter of pace. And so, like you said, when the numbers start skewing things, that's when it gets messy. I mean, ultimately, you got to just love what you do. You can't love every part of it. Content yeah. creation, like I generally don't like creating content but i know it's like a necessity parts of the process you have to find some enjoyment even in the editing you know as tedious as it is for me i do enjoy listening and reliving that conversation if it's a good conversation occasionally i'll have one where it's like i don't really want to hear this guy talk again or i don't really want to hear this girl talk again and that's fine the goal is to make content i will i have content right but it's the it's the ones that like i really connect with you know um that really 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 make it worth it and so I will choose every single time to finish that content and make more instead of stopping because of that kind of resistance. Your heart's got to be in it before anything else. Uh, and I think what works for us is just like the way that we're doing things is Alex does the editing and the visual content creation. I do like the email outreach and posting kind of stuff. Nice. So we've really worked out that balance of like what our strengths are, you know, whether that be technically or writing emails and stuff like that. Since we've been working together for so long, we had that kind of go like understanding going in of like, okay, well, you do this and I'll do this and mm. we should have everything covered. There's a lot of moving parts to it that when we were going in, we were like, all right, 
who can edit, who mm -hmm. like checklist kind of thing. The process can get tedious, but the results are always worth it. Before we get into LKT's advice for people wanting to make content, I just wanted to let you know that if you want to connect to the Little Known Track Squad even further, links in the description down below. I'll also link the episode that I was in a while ago. Nothing like a bit of cross promotion to get those numbers up. Am I right, middle class? And if you're on YouTube, comment letting me know whether or not you'd be down to eat caterpillars. I myself, I, I don't know. I'd probably have to see how it was cooked, maybe not completely against it. I'm curious what you guys would do. Let me know if you'd eat caterpillars in the comments. Now for some advice. What advice do you have for upcoming content creators that want to, you know, really up their game? What would you say to them? Man, it's a whole lot of research. I don't know what other word to use outside of research because it's such a like push. Like mm -hmm. it's so much that you need to learn just to kind of really put things together for us if it was just one of us we'd need to know how to like properly write emails actually reach out to people communicate properly like this like pick apart people's words edit do visuals like there's so much that you need to have at least a vague idea of mm -hmm to really put stuff together and then things like social media, which uh, unfortunately is really the driving factor behind a lot of creative content is so important to learn. And it's just, it's difficult. There's a lot and it changes constantly, but I want to say it pays off most of the time. Mine would be to focus on what you're passionate about. And I know that could be like an easier said than done mm -hmm. kind of thing. But if you are thoroughly enjoying what you're doing and are pursuing what you want to pursue, it'll make that journey so much more fun and like easier in the sense of like, it won't feel like work almost like it'll feel like you're doing what you love. And I think that is like the basis of content creation and anything of that nature, just doing what you want to do, because then no matter the response, you'll be proud of the result.